I want us to take a, a look at what the Lord's Supper is to each of us as Christians. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. Well, this morning we're going to have a communion service, but I got to thinking. I want us to take a, a look at what the Lord's Supper is to each of us as Christians, the benefits of who comes with believing hearts. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, Christ here says, Christ took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, also, the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Communion in the Bible and the word the Lord's Supper, however it says in the Greek, means to give thanks. That's the meaning of it. And we're going to look a little deeper at what God is telling us here in this verse uh, in Luke. And while in verse 19, God tells us that this is my body which is given for you. Now what Christ is teaching us here is that his body is like a bread and wine. <clears throat> now there's something interesting that you know but it may, maybe never occurred to you. The elements of both of them perish. They don't last forever. And Christ is telling us here that his body is like bread. And Christ spoke of his body is like bread and that it will perish one day. And what he's literally teaching us is he's going to the cross. He's going to die on the cross. He is going to perish. The breaking of bread symbolizes what will happen on the cross. His body will be broken for us to help pay for those sins. But here's an interesting thought for those of you that might know some scripture. In the Old Testament, it says not one bone will be broken on his body while he's on that cross. Now, that's interesting. Now, here's the way it works. In case you don't know Crucifying on the cross was a big thing. It wasn't for Christ. It was for everybody. All the people that went, whether they were anti, they always crucified him on the cross. And there was, a, what, two guys, one on each side, thieves. They were they put on the cross, not because of Christ, but because of what they did. And on just to, But what would happen is, over a period of time, some, they would be still alive. So what they would do is they would go up, break their legs, so they couldn't hold themselves up anymore, and by the fact that they fall would create death to come very soon. But when they went to Christ, guess what? He was already dead. See, they didn't kill Christ on the cross. I don't know if you ever thought about that. Christ gave up the ghost himself. And so when that Roman soldier came up, wait a minute, he's dead. He didn't break his leg bones. Isn't that interesting how Scripture comes together? Plus now we got the wine, represents Christ's blood. The wine represents a new covenant. When Christ died on the cross, we entered a new covenant. The Old Testament was the Old Covenant. We are now living by a new covenant, which we'll talk about later. The blood ratified the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. They did not. They had to sacrifice all these animals all the time. It was a ratification of it. Now Christ, with his blood, is ratifying the new covenant that we're to live on. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of from sin. That's how important the blood is. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it speaks about that. It says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. It's got to be done. It had to be. The body and the blood, the two most important parts of the body, had to be used at the cross to clear us of our sin. Next, God tells us to do this in remembrance of me. God tells us here in the main verse, the purpose of the supper is to remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. Now, let's face it. I don't know about you, but I'll venture to say what I'm about to say is true. We live in a hectic world today. We have more to do than we can be done in one single day. And we never seem to get caught up on anything. 
at all. And we live. And we have a tendency because we're so busy trying to do things, even, you know, looking for jobs, uh, trying to uh, pay for things and, and looking for new homes and vehicles to sell and different. I mean, we all got things we got to do. And we have a tendency not to think about Christ as much. You know, it's interesting. Paul said something one time, one part of the sermon this morning. He says, it's better that a man marries a woman rather than, you know, because of the marriage and the sex and, and different things like that. But here's what he says afterwards. I wish that all of you were like me, that he didn't have that problem. And he said, the reason is because if you're like me, you'll spend more time with me than you did with your family and your wife and kids. Isn't that interesting? That interesting thought. We don't spend enough time. And God's telling us here, you have to review. We need to do this continually. Why? To keep reminding us what accomplished on that cross and what he did for us. Remember, God the Father could not look down on Christ the moment the world, the sins of the world were on him. He had to pay the debt, which was the only way that was going to get us to heaven. But in the interest in it, he couldn't even look down. This is why Christ cried out in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. This to me is the greatest hurt that took place. Dying to me, I, I, this is the way I look at it. Christ came from heaven. He knows what it's like to be in heaven. He's God in the flesh. He comes down. He becomes man as well as God in the flesh. Dying was no big deal. He knew exactly where he was going because he's been there. So to me, personally, dying wasn't a big deal for him because he knew where he was going. We don't. We've never been there. We don't know. we got to do it totally by faith. But he's been there. What was the big deal? I think the biggest deal was what took place right here. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sebastani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For the first time in all eternity, God the Father withdrew his blessings from God the Son. He couldn't look at him. He couldn't look because of the sins Christ had. That was the big deal. That was the, the true sacrifice, and he did it all for us. Couldn't even look down. That's how righteous God is and how holy he is. And what gets me is Jesus says something that every Christian needs to really get a hold of. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Are we as holy as we should be? Do we honor God in everything that we do? Does everybody around us know we're saved? And that we love God and that we live differently than the regular people that aren't saved. There's too many people, and I'm afraid to say, that I know of that use foul language. They just they just don't live on Christ's life, but yet they say they're saved. Christ knew that this was coming. And I think one of the reasons, if we jump back to the Garden of Gethsemane, remember when he prayed an hour three times separately? His prayer was, if this cup be taken away, he didn't want to go to the cross. The man's side didn't want to go, didn't want to die. He knew what was going to happen. And he knew the hurt he was going to go through because he knew when he carried the sins of the world, God the Father was going to have to withdraw from him. Another purpose of the supper is proclaiming his death until he returns. What's the next thing in, in Revelations? The rapture. That's when all, everybody that's a Christian, that's truly saved, just don't think that they're saved. Matthew chapter 7, I, I don't have the exact thing. You don't have to turn to it, but if you want to look it up, and it's in chapter 7. This is where people that came to him and said, uh, we did all these things in you. We prophesied in your name. We did all these things. And Christ says, depart from me. I never knew you. People say, oh, they were saved. No, no, no. He's saying they never were saved. But the sad part is, and this is the part that really gets me down. 
they truly thought they were saved. Because too many people are walking around and believe that, I believe Jesus Christ died for my sin. That's not salvation. That's one part of it to get saved, but that's just doing that does not get a person saved. And people don't seem to understand that. That's why we got tracks and all, so they could understand the whole process. But the biggest number one process is saying, I'm a sinner and I've sinned against the holy God, and that you really mean it. Not, oh yeah, I sin every day. That's not the type of salvation. Salvation is, I want to change. I want to take a 180 degree turn and start serving you. And the biggest thing I try to teach people, because I went through this, I made the 180 degree turn. I got saved. And guess what? I hit a brick wall. I can't live a Christ-like life. And you know what? This is what I've learned since then. The same faith that got you saved, when you make that 180 degree turn, you've got to have the faith that God will work in your life. And there's a process we call just, no, thank you. I forgot the word now. Sanctification. The process of sanctification means the process of becoming holy. In other words, every year, every month, you should be getting closer to God until the day you die. We will not be perfect until we get to heaven, but we can get pretty, pretty good down the road. And if you're not growing, something's wrong. You need to revalue. Am I truly saved? And I'll be the first to tell you, I came down here after salvation to go into the ministry. And as I started learning more and more scripture going to college, because my major was a Bible and stuff, I realized something. And I wasn't sure if I really was saved. And I went back home that night and got down on my knees and asked God to really save me. I understood salvation more than the day I thought I accepted Christ. I didn't want to take a chance. And I did it. And sometimes there's people that need to do that because they really didn't understand what they thought salvation really was. But he says here in 26, as I said, until he comes, we have become too busy. We got to be reminded of what took place at the cross. That's the whole purpose of this now, of what we're doing today. It's that important. And finally, this cup is the New Testament. The blood that we're about to drink is the symbol of the New Testament, the New Covenant. Christ's words were significant as far as the, at the end of the Old Covenant. He was saying, here's the old one, now we're going to do a new one. Think about this. The New Covenant is without the social things of the Old Testament, a ceremonial, dietary. You can eat what you want. Couldn't eat what you want back then until it was opened up. The Sabbath laws don't exist anymore. I know, that's Old Testament. Sabbath technically was yesterday. That's the Sabbath. Today, because Christ rose again, it's a new covenant. We now worship on Sunday. How about the end of all the rituals and sacrifices? We don't have to take animals and sacrifice them anymore. We don't have to go through all those rituals and they had to do different sins require different things at all. We don't have that anymore. Also an end of the priesthood. Think about that. I bet that's a good one that you never thought about. With the holy place is gone and the holy of holies was gone. Now, I don't want to confuse you, so you may ask what's going on here. Look in Mark 15:38. Mark 15, 38. And the veil of the temple was rent in twine from the top to the bottom. And now if you read the whole scripture there, this happened the moment he died on the cross. The moment he died, that happened. Now I'm going to explain something to you. I didn't think about this until my granddaughter was here talking about that rug. See that rug down there? That equaled about what that veil was. Can anybody that you know of, including yourselves, rip that with your hands? Can't. Not only that, that's how stout that was. Now, that was the doorway from the Holy of Holies, no, from the Holy Place, into the Holy of Holies. Now, who could go into the Holy of Holies? Only the priests, and only once a year, where the Ark of the Covenant is. 
And they did something to him. They put ropes on him. Why? Because if he went in there with one unconfessed sin, God would kill him instantly. Remember how God killed the guy that thought the, uh, co- yeah, the Ark of the Covenant was going to come off the thing? And he grabbed it real quick. God killed him right away. We forget how holy God really is. And he says what he means. So the, that opened up. Now what happened there? God was showing that there's no more going in and out. He opened it up to us, which I'm going to give you the next step of how this works. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Knowing not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you. What? Our body now is the temple. There was a physical temple that got the threat. Now our body, everybody that gets saved, the Holy Spirit. Remember I taught you that in Ephesians. The moment you accept Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit enters us. Everybody is saved has the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. Which is in you, which ye have of God. And ye are not your own. What do you mean we're not our own? For ye were bought with a price. What was that price? Christ dying and taking the sin of the world. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our body is the holy of holies. Now that opened up. The new covenant opened that up. Now what's that mean? It means I don't have to go through a priest or anybody else to pray to God. I get to do it directly to him. Now we do it what? Through Jesus Christ. Why? Jesus Christ is the door that opened the door up. And that's why biblically, if you study the scripture, every time you pray, you're praying to God the Father, but through Jesus Christ. See, people say, well, how can you go to heaven and you sin today and you die before you ask for forgiveness? Because God, when he looks at me, he never sees me. Guess who he sees? Jesus Christ. That's hard to understand, but maybe one day I need to uh, speak on that more. But that's technically what's happening. That's why we got to go through Christ in everything we do. He made everything possible. Answer prayers, how we live, everything goes through Jesus Christ. Now, we were bought. Because of Christ's death. And we're not our own. But you know what? We're adopted. We're adopted into the family. God now is my heavenly father. That's why we call him heavenly father. Because now I'm a son. Each of you are a daughter or a son of God. You're in a family. Christ paid the debt for us. And now we belong to God. And he says, now do this in remembrance of me. First of all, we're to give thanks to God for setting all this up for us. To give thanks to Christ for doing all that he's done. The Holy Spirit for how he worked. The Godhead didn't have to do any of this. Would you understand that? That's where the word grace comes in. It wasn't anything we did to deserve this. This was totally done because God loved us so much that he had to make a way for us to get to heaven. It had to qualify for his holiness, his righteousness. Look in John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Who just did that that we know of? The guy behind Trump jumped in front of his family just in case a bullet hit, and a bullet did hit, and he died, saving his family. And God says here, ye are my friends, if ye do whatever I command you. So if you're saved, God wants, did this all for you. He laid down his life. He made a way for us to get. We have, think about this, the greatest benefactor the world has ever seen. Because of the salvation of Jesus, through Jesus Christ. Let us remember that taking communion is to take a look back and remember what God has done for us. I hope this has really helped you a lot. Because it's more deeper than this, believe it or not. The Lord's Supper 
is more involved than what we see right now, according to Scripture. The Lord's Supper actually took place of eating, drinking, eating, and all. Drinking several times. I, I may bring that the next time we do communion. And all. So you better understand what's going on. Nothing was done by chance by God. Nothing. And they did it all for us. We should be looking forward to the coming with hope. And that rapture takes place. What a day that will be. Okay, so let's now prepare for communion. First of all, because some people are new here and not used to it, remember the plastic thing only. Tear that up. Don't tear the whole thing. you got to take your finger and kind of go over it a little bit like this until the plastic comes out. Because if you grab, you'll see the plastic separate from the other side. Then pull that open. That opens the bread only and keeps the, the, uh, the grape juice sealed. Everybody got it? Okay. Now let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Whosoever, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread or drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. God takes taking communion extremely serious. Okay. Then in the next verse he says, But let a man or a woman examine themselves, and so let them eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So what we're going to do right this moment is I'm, we're going to silent prayer, and you need to do whatever it takes to pray to God for whatever sin you know you've committed that you need to ask forgiveness for, or maybe you sin and don't know you did. But just pray to the Lord and try to get that right. Let's pray silently. Father, help us, I pray. I hope that each of us took this serious and really prayed to you and tried to get their lives perfectly right with you to take this communion. Okay, what I'm going to do now is read something, and then from that you can eat the bread. 1 Corinthians 11:23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he breaked it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and eat your bread. By the way, if you also notice, in case it never occurred to you, it's unleavened bread. Leavened bread, yeast, is a symbol of sin. Unleavened bread has no yeast in it. Okay, so if you take this now and pull it back and forth real far, then you can open up, hopefully, without spilling anything. But don't drink it. Okay. Let's pray again. I want to take one more time of prayer, silent prayer, before we take the cup and I will read the verse first. Let's pray again. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This is the cup in the New Testament in my blood. Do ye, do this, do, this do ye, as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. Go ahead and drink. Now, you know what they did afterwards? They sang a song. So let's look at 
number 40. people said Amen. we pray that we have been a blessing to you for further assistance call us at 864-270-1472 anytime send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.